Hi, everyone. Bienvenidos. I'm Desiree Berenger Carton with Your American Cancer Society, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our show today. We are here to celebrate March, National Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, and to mark another wonderful year of the 80% in every community campaign, which aims to reach and exceed colorectal cancer screening rates of 80% in communities across the nation. And what a year it's been. Uh, we hope you and your families are safe. Um, it's really hard to imagine that just 12 months ago, we gathered in person for our annual webcast and so much has changed since then, but our passion for promoting colorectal cancer screening and our awareness is as strong as ever, and we know yours is too. So we have a really special program today lined up for you with some exciting guests joining us. Um, and just an FYI, we are recording today's webcast and the replay will be posted to the NCCRT website within a few days. Um, so we'll also have time for questions at the end of the show. So please submit your questions for our guests throughout the Q&A box um, throughout the program. We wanna hear from you. And I know our guests would love to answer your questions. Um, so, and also make sure to enjoy us um, and engage with us. Um, we want you to enjoy the show, but we want you to engage with us on social media um, using the hashtag 80 in every community to share about the exciting work. Um, you're doing this March and you're doing throughout the year and we wanna hear from you. So make sure to do that. Again, the hashtag is 80 in every community and we wanna hear from you on social media. Um, so to kick us off, it is my pleasure to welcome um, our dear friend, uh, Dr. Rich Wender, Chair of Family Medicine and Community Health Perelman School of Medicine at University of Pennsylvania and the Chair of the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable. Also, Dr. Robert Smith, Vice President of Cancer Screening with the American Cancer Society and Co-Chair of NCCRT, and Dr. Lisa Richardson, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. It's so nice to have all of you on here. Thank you so much for being with us for a sixth year of our broadcast and for your continued efforts in championing this inspiring campaign. So, so great to have you guys. Um, Thank you. We are so happy. Um, Rich, we're gonna start with you. It's so nice to see you. And oh my goodness, so much has changed in the past year. The last flight I took was um, from Atlanta for last year's show. And then we've done this show in Atlanta and LA and New York, um, New York City. And this is certainly a different year, but the message is still the same. So talk to us about how the landscape for colorectal cancer screening is different in March, 2021 compared to where we were at this time last year. You know, it's hard to imagine, Desiree, that it could be any more different. Uh, although, in a way, we're starting to get back to where we were a year ago, but all the events that have happened in between uh, were pretty hard to imagine when we were all together last year. Uh, so, I, And I still remember quite vividly when the pandemic was really starting to build and we recognized that healthcare desperately needed to focus uh, on taking care of patients infected with COVID. We did not yet know how to keep each other safe, uh, how to keep our patients safe. Uh, and I remember when we made the decision along with other organizations to actively recommend that people suspend preventive care. And for those of us who have worked so hard to increase screening, that was a hard decision to make. Clearly it was the right decision. Uh, and uh, we've come a long way. And as we'll talk about today, we're now starting to see some return uh, back to uh, our, our focus on screening. Yeah, it, it's clear we're in a much different place than we were a year ago. But now that you were saying like, uh, you know, healthcare systems have had some time to adapt. So we're starting to see improvements. Yeah, it's actually pretty impressive. Uh, mm -hmm. Even going back a few months now, uh, mm -hmm. if you look at healthcare systems, including preventive care systems in, like colonoscopy, like mammography for breast cancer screening, We've learned how to keep our coworkers safe, our healthcare workers, and our patients safe. Uh, now, it often requires an additional step of doing some COVID testing before procedures, but we're seeing a really marked resurgence. Here's my concern. Uh, when you look at the levels of return, I'm worried that we're going to see a cap and that there are people who've lost employer-based insurance, people who are still worried about their health, uh, people who have financial barriers. Uh, it's not impacting everyone in all communities equally. And it just makes our work 80% in every community so much more important. 
So important and so true. Thanks, Rich. I know you're sticking around for the whole show. Um, we want to bring in Lisa. Um, hi, Lisa. How are you? Hi, Desiree. I'm doing well. Good to see you. Um, so talk to us about how COVID-19 has really impacted the CDC's work to prevent and catch cancer early. So as Rich said, you know, things, life is completely different than it used to be, but we're getting back to normal. So what happened at the beginning of the pandemic is that we were all pretty much pulled off of our work to go take care of, when it, we still are, it's been a year now, and our programs out in the fields have had the same thing. They've all been reassigned um, to do um, COVID work at the state level. So we've noticed a decrease in, you know, the activities at the state level. But having said that, you know, some of our data here at CDC shows exactly what um, Rich just said, our breast and cervical cancer screening programs dipped, the screening dipped, it's coming back up again. But as Rich said, we have to be um, looking out for those people who are, you know, hesitant to come back in. Actually terrified is a word that I've heard. And so with um, the ACS and NCCN, the National Cancer Centers Network, we launched a, um, a campaign called um, Cancer Doesn't Wait and Neither Should You. And so that is where we're beginning. We're starting to roll that work out and uh, very happy to be here today to help support um, Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month and the work we do. Thank you. Well, we're so happy to have you here. And it's true, cancer doesn't stop during a pandemic and it can't wait. Um, so I understand the CDC's works, um, you know, with healthcare organizations to use strategies to increase the colorectal cancer screening. So how are your grantee programs adapting to reaching patients um, for screening during the pandemic? So it's, it's kind of amazing. Um, we had some peer-to-peer -peer listening sessions with our programs, and they really have taken the slowdown as an opportunity to look at how they do business. And so one of our um, grantees in Wichita Falls, Texas, actually created a voucher program for fit testing that included colonoscopy. And throughout the entire pandemic, they've been mailing kits out to people in Wichita Falls, Texas, and 500 people, they've been returned and several people have um, had colonoscopies to follow up. So communities are really working hard to reach people uh, where they are. Oh, it's so important and such a dedication of the cause, right? The best test is the test that gets done. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> thank you, Lisa. I know you're sticking around as well. So thank you. Thank um, we're going to bring in Bob. Um, Bob, listen, uh, we all know this, right? 2020 was also a big year for policy changes. Um, have there been any changes to policies that impact exactly, uh, you know, colorectal cancer screenings? Muted, you Bob. You there, Bob? Are you muted? Too many mice on the desk. Wrong mouse. <laughs> That's okay. Nice to see you, Bob. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Big yeah, change, no. right? For policy, big year big for change. policy changes. Change. Yeah, this is one that, that we've been hoping for for a long time. In December, uh, the there was a bipartisan bill. It's a word we have not heard for years. Mm -hmm. uh, passed uh, that uh, called the Removing Barriers to Colorectal Cancer Screening Act. We've all known that under Medicare, that a patient could go in, get a screening colonoscopy and wake up with a surprise, a big bill, if they identified a polyp. And of course, under for Medicare beneficiaries, there was a greater likelihood that an adult would have a polyp. This could result in a, a surprise bill. Sometimes those bills were huge. Uh, there actually was a big, almost a, a lot of anecdotal information passing around that this is something that could happen. And it almost certainly was beginning to be a barrier to screening. Now that no longer is the case. Now you will not be billed if you have a procedure during your colonoscopy, which means that we can now genuinely say that colorectal cancer screening is gonna be fully covered under, under Medicare, uh, much like under the Affordable Care Act, we can say it is a fully covered service. You should not receive a surprise bill. And we think it's gonna help us increase screening in, in this population. That is absolutely wonderful. And, and this is so exciting. Um, I understand we expect to see some changes in the national guidelines for colorectal cancer screening this year as well. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, actually, everybody, I think, on this call may be aware that in 2018, mm -hmm. the American Cancer Society lowered the age to begin screening from 50 to 45. Um, we had seen, uh, well, we had known for a long time that colorectal cancer screening rates were higher in younger people and growing. But uh, thanks to some very, um, you know, 
creative and, and forward thinking work done by Becky Siegel and colleagues here at the American Cancer Society, we identified that this was a birth cohort effect, that in fact rates were rising and were likely to continue to rise. And we were already seeing higher rates in adults in uh, their early 50s and a growing trend. We looked at these data very carefully. We did the modeling work. We uh, really took a very comprehensive approach to updating the guideline and saw that it was quite sensible now to drop the age to 45. Quite simply, today, the screening, the incidence rates at age 45 are about what they were at age 50, 20 years ago. Um, we anticipated and hoped that the task force would take this same information and approach when they updated their guidelines, which would, would, would have been last year, uh, beginning that process, and they did. They released a draft new recommendation statement uh, proposing to drop the screening age to 45. That's going to be very good news. We expect that they will finalize that recommendation, and so we will have a common recommendation between the two leading purveyors of screening guidelines, ACS and the task force, in 2021. Well, that's really great to hear. Thank you, Bob. I know, again, you're sticking around. You mentioned Becky, Becky Siegel. We're going to get to her in a little bit, too, as well. So really great information, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rich, I mean, you know, hearing from everyone so far, you know, I mean, we have to continue this important, impactful work. And, you know, how can we work together toward 80% every community this year? You know, first of all, it is terrific to see the policy change. Uh, not surprised our longtime colleagues and friends at CDC, you know, didn't miss a beat and uh, uh, really pivoted uh, just the way healthcare systems across the country did. Well, we did the same thing in NCCRT. So uh, the energy, I think, is as high as ever. In some level, the passion is even greater because we know we've lost time. So at our annual virtual meeting last November, uh, because it was virtual, we set an all-time record for participation, mm -hmm. over 750 attendees uh, at that meeting. And the, it was incredible. We, we dealt with the issues of disparities and racism uh, and the issues of the pandemic. Uh, I, I think it really, COVID really put a face on disparities. Mm -hmm. we, we, it wasn't just that we were reporting them because we've become numb, far too numb to the disparities, but it really helped us understand why, what the social determinants of health are that lead to these disparities. Uh, and everyone is committed to sharing, to learning, uh, and, uh, and, and frankly, uh, making up for lost time and getting our screening rates back to where they belong. Yeah, that's what we all want. Um, we so appreciate it. I know all you guys, again, are sticking around for questions. Before we move on to our next panel, I know, Rich, um, we want to take a look at some of these photos that our partners shared from Dress in Blue Day on March 5th. And it's so exciting to see the energy um, from this campaign from around the country. And anytime when I started seeing these um, before our show, it really made me miss being in person for today's <laughs> show even more. And I just, I love seeing the momentum and the support across the country. Um, one of my favorite campaigns, really, initiatives, and it's just so important. Yeah, it's, uh, and there's, I'm seeing the face of friends and colleagues. Yes. It, you have to realize the, that this is the same group who rose to the occasion to uh, uh, adapt and to the COVID pandemic, put their own lives at risk in many cases for the COVID pandemic for some of our healthcare workers. Uh, continue to push forward on policy issues like our friends here in Kentucky that I see in front of us. Uh, so uh, it's, uh, it really is inspiring uh, and, and it really shows this community will not be uh, stopped. Uh, we are undaunted. Uh, we will cope with the new reality, uh, try to partner with everyone to reduce uh, the risks uh, of illness uh, of all kinds, including the pandemic uh, and COVID-19. Uh, but we're going to move the issue of COVID-19 forward. It is great to see, and you're so right. Strong and resilient, no one's stopping, and it becomes a family event, too, to make sure people are spreading the word, so thank you. Um, and we know so many of you folks are hosting events this month, so be sure to share on social media with us using the hashtag 80 in every community. We want to see your pictures. Uh, we want to see all those posts, so make sure you send us those and post them, and, and we want to see that using that hashtag, 80 in every community. So earlier this month, the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable announced its 2021 slate of 80% Every Community National Achievement Award honorees. 
the awards program is in its sixth year. I can't believe we've been doing this six years. It's amazing. And look how far we've come. And it's really competitive. Um, the honorees represent a diverse group of stakeholders and organizational types, including health systems, community health centers, state-based coalitions, physician champions, and others. So Rich, I would love for you to do the honor of announcing this year's grand prize winner. I really would be delighted to do that. And I do promise I'm not moving COVID-19 forward. We're moving that out the door. We're moving I know what you meant. Cancer <laughs> forward. We know what you meant. The, uh, but, uh, and, and part of that is, is being able to honor our grand champion. We had a lot of tremendous applicants as we do every year. And it's, it's inspiring to read them. But uh, the, the one group that really stood out for us uh, this year was UCLA Health in Los Angeles. Uh, and as you're going to hear, this is their third year, but really innovative program. Uh, and I love, we, we all loved the, the many at, aspects of the program that they brought into play, uh, not just for their employees, for the patients they take care of, but for their entire community. And that's really what 80% in every community is all about. So UCLA Health is our winner. Congratulations. Thank you, Rich, for announcing that. Well, we're thrilled to have two people live with us today to represent UCLA Health's exciting work. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Fola May, Assist Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of California, Los Angeles, Director of Quality Improvement in Gastroenterology at UCLA Health, and Director of the May Health Services Research Laboratory at UCLA Health. Those are a lot of titles, Dr. May. And Cameron Kalunian, who practices law in Los Angeles and is joining us today to share his experiences as a colorectal cancer survivor who received his diagnosis and treatment at UCLA Health. So we are so happy to have you both. So thank you so much for joining us. Dr. May, we're gonna start with you. How are you? And congratulations. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, we are so excited to have you on. So talk to us a little bit about some of the things that US, UCLA Health has done to increase colorectal cancer screening. Thank you so much. And I, I just wanna say thank you so, to, so much to everyone for having us and for this honor. We started working on our CRC awareness campaign in 2018. We have a very large health system with close to 400,000 primary care enrollees, but our screening rate was really hovering in the low 50 percentile range for a while. We found that although our providers are working really hard to prescribe screening, there wasn't a coordinated effort across our divisions and departments. So we developed the CRC workgroup. This is a multidisciplinary team. It includes primary care, gastroenterology, quality improvement, population health, and many other areas within our health system. And we really had three major goals. First, we wanted to raise awareness among providers, staff, and patients. We wanted to also implement a quality improvement program to make structural changes in our health system that would increase screening rates. And we wanted to increase awareness in the broader Los Angeles community, including medically underserved populations. So over the past three years, we've engaged patients, providers, and staff through multiple activities on campus and in greater Los Angeles, and also through via um, web-based platforms as well. We host public awareness events with the inflatable colon at UCLA and at our safety net affiliates. We provide lectures on screening, colon health and nutrition. And we, pr we produce articles and videos and other content that we can share on our website, through social media, on local TV and radio. Our patient stories are, are another essential part of our campaign and we'll hear one of those really powerful stories from Cameron in a bit. And we've also some, done some work with community health workers in the Latino Latinx community to increase screening. Of course, we've had to adapt many of these efforts during COVID-19, but we were successful in moving much of our messaging to mailed and web-based formats. So much amazing work, Fola. I mean, what are the results you're seeing? Can you tell the audience? Of course, I'd love to share. I mean, our CRC work group has implemented a dashboard. We're really proud of this dashboard. It's based on our electronic health record. It allows us to actually track our screening rates overall by provider and by clinic at any moment in time for our health system. And despite COVID-19 and the initial drop in screening rates that we saw at UCLA Health, our rate has increased by 10 percentage points since we started our efforts. And this in big part, especially during COVID-19 has been you know, really due to emphasizing the use of stool-based tests like FIT, 
for patients when it's appropriate, especially when our endoscopy units were closed or when patients were hesitant about coming into our health centers. That's really phenomenal. That's awesome. Thank you. Um, Cameron, we're going to bring you in. Um, you know, I understand you were diagnosed five years ago at age of 35. It's so young and you had no family history. Uh, tell us a little bit about your diagnosis and treatment, about your journey. Of course. Uh, as you said, I was diagnosed at 35 and I did not have a, a family history of colorectal cancers. Uh, my story is one of a little bit of luck and a lot of help. Um, I had one symptom, it was blood in my stool. And when I say a little bit of luck, that was actually part of the luck that my tumor ended up being at the recto sigmoid junction. And I was able to experience symptoms uh, at, a, at a fairly early stage. I went and saw my primary care physician at UCLA, Dr. Jennifer Young, and my symptoms were met with concern, but not panic, which was really reassuring to me as a patient, but also allowed me to understand the importance of the follow-up care. Um, the integrated care I received at UCLA was both coordinated and comprehensive. I was uh, given a fecal test. And then uh, when that came back with blood in the stool, I was referred to a gastro. We started with a sigmoidoscopy. They saw the, uh, the tumor at that point. Uh, they referred me for a colonoscopy. I had scans at uh, UCLA health centers and everybody all along was coordinated uh, through UCLA. And uh, my surgeon and oncologist were all in the UCLA department. Uh, I, had a, I had resection of a foot of colon about three months after diagnosis, uh, or, or I'm sorry, initial onset of symptoms, and was uh, found to be at stage one. They were able to completely resect the uh, tumor. There were, my, my lymph nodes came back clean. I was even so lucky that I had a, a little bit of a redundant colon, so uh, I, not much of a change. I guess the Catholic school nuns at my elementary school were right when they said I was full of it. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I, because of the care I got at UCLA and the comprehensive uh, just treatment I received and the awareness that was present at every level of my care, uh, cancer was a detour for me in my life, but not the end of my journey. And the five years that I, uh, since I, I've been diagnosed and cured from cancer, I got married, I bought a house, I became a father, became an uncle, I advanced in my career made all these memories and got to have these impacts on the loved one, on the lives of the loved ones around me that I wouldn't have had without that care from UCLA and that comprehensive awareness all the way down. Oh, Cameron, um, we are so glad to hear you're doing okay and had so many wonderful things happen. And like you said, that was um, not the end of your journey. And, you know, congrats on being a father and getting married and being an uncle and being successful in your career. And most importantly, having your health and you are doing so well and you had such wonderful care. I mean, so how do you think organizations like UCLA Health can be innovative and proactive in reaching patients for screening? You know, as I said earlier, it's a lots of help, and that's the key is is, is being in, is being inter, integrated in the care. Um, the critical role my primary care physician, Dr. Young, played in initiating that follow up, I don't think can be understated. Um, I didn't have to be an advocate for my care. I was uh, prodded appropriately to to seek the care I needed. Um, I also think health systems like UCLA can play a huge role by reaching out to communities. As Dr. May said, uh, you know, you'll see UCLA uh, bulletins on the radio and or hear them on the radio and see them on the local news. I've seen Dr. May's face on uh, our local channels uh, in the morning news, and it prevents that that it, it spreads awareness of, of the, this disease, and it really helps with the most important thing, which is breaking down the stigma of screening, of talking about your symptoms. Uh, as I said, I'm a father, and my daughter has a book called Everybody Poops. People don't like to talk about poop, but breaking down that stigma, breaking down those things are so important for people getting that care that they need. It's so true. People don't like to talk about it. It's taboo, but it is so important. And like easy stool tests that you can do, you know, um, take home test or, you know, get the colonoscopy, you know, like listen to your body like you did. Um, your, your story is so inspiring. We're so thankful that you um, are an advocate um, for screening and for sharing your story. So um, thank you, Cameron. We so appreciate it. We're getting a lot of um, messages in the chat, Cameron, just, you know, um, congratulations on being healthy and being a survivor and for sharing your story. Um, and, and Fola, we're getting a lot of messages um, for UCLA Health. Um, congratulations on, um, you know, being the award winner, the grand prize winner. So um, would you like to share anything more about what's next for UCLA Health's campaign? 
Sure. Well, first, I want to say thank you to everyone for those kind messages. I want to say thank you, Cameron, for coming and sharing your story. We know how powerful and impactful these stories are. It's very often that I get messages in, you know, on social media. I saw a patient story on Instagram or on Twitter. I need to get screened. Can you get me connected? So thank you so much, Cameron, for doing that. And honestly, I, you know, I want to say that we have a ways to go at UCLA. Again, this is a huge team effort. I'm just one part of a huge team that does all of this work. And we realize that getting to that 80% goal is going to take us some time, especially with the health system that's our size. We're now planning additional workflow changes in our clinics. We want to help offload our busy primary care providers. Overall, we want to stick with our multi-level, multi-component approach as we feel it really takes interventions that address the patient factors, the provider factors, and the system level factors to really get this done. So we, again, we just want to thank you very much for this wonderful recognition. Well, we can't thank you enough for all the work that you and your team are doing. And again, thank you to Cameron for sharing his story. Um, so thank you both. So we so appreciate it. Um, so now let's take a moment to recognize the remaining 2021 National Achievement Award honorees. As we stated earlier, the NCCRT's National Achievement Award program tries to recognize outstanding achievements from diverse settings. This year, in addition to our grand prize winner, there were five other honorees. So our first one, the American Association of Medical Assistants is an honoree in the Professional Association Association category. In 2019, the AAMA partnered with NCCRT to launch an exciting year-long education initiative to inform and equip medical assistants to educate patients about the importance of colorectal cancer screening. Congratulations. In the Cancer Coalition State Roundtable category, the Arkansas Cancer Coalition has led a multifaceted approach to increase colorectal cancer screening rates among the state residents and saw statewide screening rates rise from 10 percentage points in just six years. Congratulations. Dr. Cynthia Yoshida, a gastroenterologist, is receiving recognition as a physician champion. She co-chairs the Virginia Colorectal Cancer Roundtable and is leading innovative work to increase colorectal cancer screening both through the University of Virginia and among uninsured patients in rural Virginia. Congratulations, Dr. Yoshida. And in the Community Health Center category, Esperanza Health Centers in Chicago applied a team-based care approach to increase colorectal cancer screening rates from a baseline of 43% in 2015 to rates of 80% and above since 2019. That is so impressive. Congratulations. And Felicidades, right? And St. Vincent de Paul Medical Center in Phoenix is being recognized as a free clinic. The clinic began a quality improvement project to increase colorectal cancer screening rates from a baseline of 8% in 2015 and is now reaching or exceeding screening rates of 80% among their largely, largely uninsured patient population. It's just incredible. Felicidades to all. Congratulations. Um, thank you so much for all your hard work. Rich, this is so inspiring. Every year I'm in awe of everyone <laughs> and what they do to make such a difference in our communities. These awardees are amazing. Oh, I think you're on mute, Rich. Well, it's bound to happen. Uh, the, <laughs> the, uh, well, we sent out the solicitation for uh, nominations this year. We said, well, everybody's, you know, focusing on COVID. We're not going to get the group that we normally get. Well, silly us. I mean, th this group was tremendous. Uh, everybody was, could not have been more deserving. It was very hard to just pick one grand prize winner. Uh, really cool to see uh, medical assistants in the critical role that they uh, uh, play in getting screening done, uh, the federally qualified health centers, the individual champions, tremendous work. We're really proud and thankful to all of them. Oh my gosh. I'm so proud. And I'm just so grateful for all the hard work that they're doing and reaching so many communities. When you see those percentage rates, it's incredible. Um, so next up, we're going to turn our focus back to national data and trends in colorectal cancer screening. Um, but our guests will stick around for questions at the end. So make sure to send those questions and make sure if you're posting any pictures or, you know, make sure to tell us what you're doing. Um, hashtag 80 in every community. So it is my pleasure to welcome Rebecca Siegel, Senior Scientific Director, Surveillance, Surveillance Research with the American Cancer Society. Hi, Rebecca. I'm so glad you're here. 
Hi, Desiree. It's an honor to be here with this very esteemed group and congratulations to FOLA and uh, it's all so exciting. So um, I'm very, very happy to join you. This is my first time actually. Well, I'm so excited because we all know you here at the American Cancer Society um, and we want the rest of the um, nation to know you because you do so much work and um, we are so excited because Rebecca, you lead the American Cancer Society's Cancer Facts and Figures publication and that this year it includes a special report on COVID-19 and cancer. So I don't know if um, folks across the country know you lead that, but now they do and it, it's an amazing uh, resource and tool. And um, could you share a little bit the big picture look at how the pandemic is impacting colorectal cancer screening rates, related issues in this in general? Sure. So uh, it was inevitable to cover COVID and cancer in the special section this year in Facts and Figures. And uh, as we all know and have heard more about today, there were substantial disruptions in care. This is a figure from the special section that shows how these delays in screening and treatment can cause delayed diagnosis and late stage cancer, and then ultimately increases in cancer mortality. So um, specifically for colorectal cancer, there was an estimated 80 to 90% drop in uh, colonoscopy screening in March of last year. And this means not only less uh, early detection, but also less cancer prevention. Wow. Um, you, when you hear those numbers, you know, um, it is, you know, frightening. Talk to us a little bit of how COVID-19 is affecting our efforts to promote health equity. Um, well, actually, I'm going to show you one more slide okay. before that um, to just give you an example of what this impact could be on cancer mortality. Early on in the pandemic, the NCI estimated uh, 10,000 excess deaths from breast and colorectal cancer, including 4,500 excess deaths specifically from colorectal cancer mm -hmm. because of these delays in, uh, in screening and treatment. And so this was, of course, early in the pandemic, and, and no one knows we won't have that data for some time. But thankfully, as Rich mentioned, screening rates have rebounded. Um, it doesn't seem to be uh, to the level of mammography for colonoscopy, but that could be because health systems are doing more stool testing and that wasn't measured. Right, right. Um, so there's a light at the end of the tunnel, as we, you know, which is good. Um, exactly. It was a rough year, but we're getting back there to the screen. And like you said, the take-home tests, right, are just the at-home tests are um, really easy and accessible. Right, so important. Yeah, um, and, and so, and how are our efforts, you know, um, going to promote health equity? How is COVID-19 affecting those efforts to promote health equity? Right, of course, that's the obvious question. And um, the pandemic has been an obstacle uh, because of the stunning disparities in COVID-19 itself, as well as the secondary consequences. This is the most recent data from CDC. Uh, this is actually, a little bit different from what we published in uh, Facts and Figures because it's changed since then. But you can see that uh, Black and Hispanic individuals are only slightly more likely to be diagnosed with COVID-19, yet they're three times more likely to be hospitalized with severe illness and twice as likely to die from the disease compared to white individuals. And as I mentioned, this is um, secondary consequences are, have uh, incredible disparities as well. These are unemployment rates, which are of course linked to access to care. And uh, although for white individuals, double digit employment ended in June, as of last month, 2021, Black individuals are still experiencing double digit unemployment. And so um, we don't have specific metrics on insurance status and those types of things that are that would even um, better tell us what's going on with access to care, but uh, health equity has definitely been impacted. Yeah, for sure. When you see these numbers like that, thank you for sharing that. Stick around. I wanted to bring Rich in because I want to hear, you know, what um, the NCCRT is doing to respond to the impacts from COVID-19. Yeah, obviously this was uh, 
a great concern. Uh, it's, it's central to our mission, and we felt the obligation to track what our members are doing to share best practices. Uh, we continue to do that, uh, sharing it through publications and webinars. Uh, back in June, actually, of 2020, so not that long into it, we recognized that uh, we needed to provide guidance to our partners, to the nation on how to reignite screening, uh, despite the fact that uh, COVID-19 was still very much uh, part of our country. Uh, so we uh, put together a wonderful team that uh, worked on four aligning statements with specific guidance uh, on guidance to patients, to healthcare systems, to primary care providers on how to uh, increase screening uh, despite COVID being present. Uh, we put a lot of emphasis on stool testing as a way to prioritize uh, and limit the number of necessary colonoscopies. At our annual meeting, we then had a panel of experts uh, who came from different aspects of the healthcare system to share the impact of COVID, show, uh, show how they were uh, still achieving good screening rates, whatever they needed to do to overcome the barriers, uh, even in the face of COVID, uh, sharing best practices and successes. And now next month, which I'm really excited about, we are reconvening the authors who wrote that June 2020 playbook uh, and hosting a webinar to see where we're at now uh, and to see what, uh, how we can not just uh, get back to where we were, but try to fuel uh, makeup screening uh, to, to reach those uh, who had delays uh, and then get back right up or even beyond the screening rates where we started. That's great to hear to make sure folks get back, you know, to their screenings. That's great. Um, thank you, Rich. Um, Rebecca, you know, I know our audience is always eager to hear from you the latest on general colorectal cancer trends, um, but especially any updates on the trends in early age onset colorectal cancer. What can you share with us? Well, I'm always happy to talk about these numbers, as everyone knows. Uh, so we were happy to report in January in Facts and Figures 2021 that there's been an overall decline in colorectal cancer mortality of 55% from 1970 to 2018. That's because of changing patterns in risk factors like declines in smoking, as well as, of course, increased screening and better treatments. But what this figure masks is the increase in death rates among people under age 55. And this is, of course, because of the increase in incidence that we're seeing in this age group. There are also disparities in uh, early onset colorectal cancer. And I wanted to highlight this is some new data that we've been looking at because it's such an important uh, topic. So we uh, have noticed that incidence rates for early onset uh, colorectal cancer have uh, converged in black and white individuals. However, mortality rates remain 30% higher in black people than in white people under age 50. And now that there's more consensus on screening beginning at 45, as Bob was mentioning, um, it's more important than ever for clinicians to offer stool testing as an option in addition to colonoscopy, not only because uh, people 45 to 49 are lower risk, but also because people of color are more often uh, apt to choose those types of options. Thank you so much, Rebecca. You're welcome. That's just such important information. And when you break it down like that for someone like me who does it, you know, to see and how you explain the numbers, um, such important work. And thank you for doing that and explaining it to us and for your insight. We so appreciate it. I know you're going to stick around for some questions. So thank you. I um, sure will. We just want to make sure um, that we were going to share with everyone who is attending all um, the additional American Cancer Society resources to help all of our wonderful partners adapt to the challenges of providing cancer screening uh, during a pandemic. Um, so in October, the American Cancer Society developed um, a guide summarizing the impact of the pandemic on cancer care and provided guidance on how public health agencies, healthcare provider, and screening advocates across the nation could promote and deliver cancer 
cancer screenings um, appropriately, safely, um, you know, throughout the, the pandemic. So um, then just this past month, um, the American Cancer Society released a cancer screening messaging guidebook that includes some great information on both old and new barriers to cancer screening, um, delivers updated findings on how the pandemic has impacted cancer care, and shares um, tested messages that will resonate through the pandemic. So um, really great info, and these and the other resources can be accessed um, through the links in the chat or on the NCCRT and the American Cancer Society website. So um, make sure to check them out. Um, really great information. So really, really um, useful that will help. Um, so we'd like now to invite all of our wonderful guests um, back on to answer questions from our participants. If you haven't already, please submit your questions in the Q&A box and we're gonna get to as many as we can. Um, we're going to start off I believe with our first question, let's go and see. We're going to go with Lisa, um, Dr. Richardson from the CDC. Um, how can we learn more about the voucher for fit testing program? Great question. So we can actually get you in touch with the people who have um, done that work. We're currently writing a success story that will be posted on our website um, during the month of March. So we're happy to, whoever needs information can get in touch with me, um, lrichardson at cdc.gov. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this is for Rich or Bob. Um, with regard to the Medicare loophole closing, is that only for Medicare patients and can private insurance plans, can they still charge for removal of polyps? Yeah, I'll be happy to go first on that. Uh, okay. So uh, this issue came up not long after the passage of the Affordable Care Act uh, that required coverage without cost sharing. Uh, in most commercial plans, but not all, in most commercial plans. Uh, the administration then issued a clarification about this issue uh, that, uh, in fact, the removal, identification removal of a polyp was to be considered inclusive, uh, included in that screening event and should not generate a copay. Uh, so for the majority of commercial plans, patients should not have been uh, charge to copay. There still are some commercial plans out there that fall outside of the guidance of that. Uh, of that. Fortunately, those are relatively few. So uh, actually for some years now, patients should not have been having a copay. Uh, that's why we were so focused on the Medicare population, which is not subject to the rules of the Affordable Care Act or that clarification. Uh, that needed to be passed by a specific statute that uh, required coverage without copay and why we were so excited. Uh, I, I, a big shout out to our colleagues uh, around the country who worked on this. Um, ACS Cancer Action Network did a fantastic job. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I had a joke with them that uh, having met with Medicare so many times over the years on this, that the day it happened, I, I would retire. Didn't work. Still <laughs> That's great. Bob, you want to add to that? Yeah, so it's one of the things that we do see is sometimes people will get these surprise bills simply because there's no one to referee whether they should have gotten them or not. You know, um, the, the, the facility where the exam was done submits a diagnostic code, the insurance pays for it, and the patient is wondering, maybe not even wondering, maybe just not understanding that they shouldn't have had to pay and they end up getting a bill. This is particularly challenging and we're trying to figure out how we can raise awareness um, across the board. I'm, I mean, I even had a conversation with a, a representative who argued with me about this after we had passed the, the recommendation. Um, I think the other thing, and we did get a question about this, is whether this same change and whether the same sort of um, issue with Medicare uh, would would be, or, or, or any of the implants would, if somebody, gets an FOBT and has a positive finding. Mm -hmm. We don't want to think of colonoscopy as to being diagnostic. It's really part of the continuum of screening. And so a person who gets a lower cost screening test and needs a follow-up colonoscopy should not have to pay for it. Uh, but that still seems to be a problem. And um, if anybody has any newer information, but it's an, a continued challenge to work, work towards. Yeah, um, we have another question, Bob, um, for you and Rich as well. Um, with um, Can we talk about the challenges with insurance coverage um, for 45-year-olds to 49-year-olds? Um, the change in the USPT, 
USPSTF, these acronyms <laughs> always get me, you guys, um, should address that, right? Yeah, the, uh, uh, according to the Affordable Care Act, uh, all USPSTF guidelines that receive an A and B uh, or A or B rating, uh, most commercial plans are required to cover without cost sharing so that once the USPSDF guidelines are final, which they're not yet, and then I believe the health plans get a year, somebody could correct me if it's less than that, I believe it's a year to put into action uh, compliance with that requirement. So coverage of all of the screening options may still be 18 months down the road. Many uh, insurance companies are making this change on their own. So it's perfectly reasonable mm -hmm. to find out if your insurance company is covering it. And very importantly, all of the insurance coverages are play, paying for fit testing. There's never a, mm -hmm. uh, an insurance company that turns down fit. Now, if you have a positive and then do a follow-up, it may be coded as diagnostic. That's what we were just talking about. And there may be cost sharing. So uh, we still have to work on that part of the equation. Thank you, Rich. Um, Bob, um, what's the status of legislation to prevent an out-of-pocket cost for a colonoscopy that resulted from another type of abnormal colorectal cancer screening? Yeah, it's hard to say, and it's highly variable, and it certainly is going to differ between big plans and smaller plans. Um, you know, it's you know, we, we just finished a, you know, a very long article on the history of colorectal cancer screening. If you look back at this, we have known for nearly a century about the adenoma carcinoma sequence, early screening and the value of finding the cancer early, actually even then if finding polyps if you, in during an examination. And here we are in 2021 and we are still grappling with barriers that uh, uh, affect uptake. So I think we really do want to, you know, double down again, you know, oftentimes we think we can just present the logic of doing something sensible and not treating uh, throwing a cost barrier in front of somebody when they have a much higher probability of disease than they did before they had any examination at all. If we recognize that cost, any kind of cost is a barrier to preventive health, then why put a cost burden in front of somebody who very well may have the disease? So, uh, you know, the advocacy really has to continue. It has to become more aggressive. And ultimately, we, we should have a very seamless path to any screening tests that is approved and recommended to be a complete screening test for colorectal cancer. Yeah, we're well, getting so many great questions. Um, did you wanna say something, Rich? I, I was just gonna quickly ask uh, Fola May, who actually is the one person on the panel who put scopes uh, uh, in people, what her experience has been in, in California and in LA in coverage. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I was nodding my head when you said that, because I do think it's highly variable. I think on two things. One, some of the insurance companies have already started covering at 45, even though we're still in a draft statement from USPFTF. And the other problem that we see are these loopholes. So first, the loophole with uh, colonoscopies identifying polyps as they're supposed to do, right? But we've solved that in December 2020. But now the, the persistent one is the non-colonoscopic screening tests that result in a colonoscopy. So we have a ways to go. Um, I think a lot of us spend a lot of time on the phone talking to insurance companies to explain what's happening. And, and sometimes we're successful at getting it covered. Um, but unfortunately, sometimes our patients do see a bill. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, again, you guys are sending in some phenomenal questions. We're learning so much. Um, so thank you guys for your insight. Um, Rich or Bob, what, I think you touched on this, I believe, but let's talk about this again. Um, how long is it anticipated it will take for health plans and state-based programs with health departments to align with the 45 age recommendations now that you know um, USPTF has drafted its support? Did you say like 18 months? It, that's for insurance coverage. You know, th this is talking about kind of everybody who cares about this issue kind of changing their messaging. Mm -hmm. And that's a really good question. And it's one of the reasons why we have the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable and all these state-based initiatives. Uh, the CDC as such a vital partner is because we can push the messaging out more quickly. We can provide tools. Uh, in fact, one of the things we're doing is producing an updated communications tool. So uh, it's, it's a great question. I think it depends on all of us to drive that message through to health plans more quickly. And it's going to be like everything else. Some will already there, right? Already there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And others will be more, will be slower in the uptake. Alignment of guidelines to 45, huge step. It'll help enormously. That's great. Sooner, hopefully the sooner the better for everyone. Um, also for Rich and Bob, um, or one of you guys, um, is it only Medicare that no longer will charge for procedures during screening colonoscopy? What about anesthesia? That is where there were increased charges in the examples I know of. That was from a viewer. Yeah, great question. I might put Dr. May back on uh, on the hot seat here <laughs> to, to comment because it's this is a, a topic that's getting a lot of attention is, is where are the different costs? I think for years, we weren't paying too much attention to the anesthesia costs. I think we're paying a lot more attention now. Uh, Dr. May, you wanna comment a little bit on that? Sure, I can. Uh, and again, this is highly variable on where you live and where you receive care. Mm -hmm. But there's basically three ways that this colonoscopy can be done. There are some patients who do it unsedated, so there's no medication. There are, most patients at least get conscious sedation or full anesthesia. And the cost of the procedure vary on whether you get conscious sedation, which is kind of like a twilight sleep as we describe it, or the full sedation with something like propofol that puts you to sleep and it requires another doctor and an anesthesiologist to also be in the room. So our health system, for example, was a health system that used mostly conscious sedation. And in the last three years, we've switched to all general anesthesia. And I think that kind of mimics the trends that we've seen in New York and in other parts of the country where more people are using the full general anesthesia. And the costs sometimes are not covered depending on your insurance. So these are important questions to ask. They're important to ask your doctor. They're important to ask your insurer. Will it be covered if polyps were removed? What kind of um, sedation is covered under my insurance? Such yeah. a good question. Um, and, you know, and if I, I'd known, I didn't even think about that when I got my, I got my colonoscopy this summer. And I got a big charge. And so I didn't understand, but yes, everything clear. And I'm glad I got my colonoscopy. So these are such great questions. Rich, did you want to respond? I have yeah, just, just to add that. Uh, yeah, I was, you know, we worked for years with our, our colleague in New Hampshire, Lynn Butterly, who uh, entirely for uninsured patients. And until recently she was using, con you know, that twilight sleep approach for virtually everybody. I'm curious if she still is uh, and patients do very well, but uh, you know, we're, we're going to have, it, it is a shifting scene and one we need to uh, keep focused on. Yeah, thank you. Um, Dr. May, what was your biggest challenge in coordinating CRC work group efforts at UCLA Health with such a large group and staff? Honestly, I think the biggest challenge was just making it a health system priority. Um, so anyone who knows me, I'm always talking about colon cancer and colon cancer awareness and prevention. Um, it's, it's just my career passion, but not everyone recognizes how common colon cancer is. And so it took a couple years. I mean, I probably started in 2015 asking leadership in our health system, can we do something to highlight this second most common cause of uh, cancer related deaths in the United States that is largely preventable. So for me, the biggest challenge was just getting all of the key leadership lined up at the same time saying, yes, we want to dedicate resources towards this effort. Yes, we can have a multidisciplinary team because it's not a gastroenterologist that's going to solve this problem. It's really quality mm -hmm. improvement and primary care. So I really leaned on my colleagues yep. in those areas to get this done. So great. Thank you. Yep. Um, um, Becky, what are some external factors that we can account for when we work to emphasize prevention for those with no family history, but at risk of CRC? Uh, modifiable risk factors, I think, is what you're asking about. And those would be, you know, certainly for many, many cancers, not smoking, um, but also uh, maintaining a healthy body weight, uh, consumption of processed and red meat, uh, low to none, because we know um, processed meat is actually considered a carcinogen because of its relationship with colorectal cancer. Um, also getting sufficient dairy. Dairy is associated with reduced risk and a healthy diet, you know, lots of fruits and vegetables and fiber. And the, the evidence is, um, less conclusive for that, but it's very difficult to study diet. And so of course, mm -hmm. if you're eating a healthier diet, that's gonna be better. 
Yeah, good info. Thank oh, you. Oh, physical Pat. activity. I'm sorry. I yes. forgot. Of um, being very physically active also <laughs> reduces your risk. Yes. Yeah, so eat right, you know, live a healthy lifestyle, be physically active, um, nutrition and fitness um, go hand in hand there. So thank you. Right. Becky. Basically uh, all the things that were impossible during COVID-19. I know <laughs> we weren't, I was not good. I can't speak for everyone else, but I know Hard to do. Do a lot of hikes, but then we kind of ate a lot too. Um, <laughs> so you know, we were outside a lot. I know now we're all ready for a new year and, you know, it's all about fitness focus now. So good stuff. Um, you know, Cameron, I'd love to bring you in. I know we have some more questions. We have a few more minutes, but, um, Cameron, we have a question for you. Do you have any tips to share with survivors on getting started with telling our story publicly or getting involved with advocacy? Cause sometimes it's not easy for folks to share their journey and you've been so open about it and you've helped so many by telling your story. Well, you know, I mean, it's important to me to tell my story because of the, I, like I said, I had a lot of, a lot of help. And I think raising awareness is, is really important. Um, I got involved in, in telling my story by reaching out to my, my physicians at UCLA. Uh, and that's how I was put in touch with Dr. May. And she's been a great advocate for sharing the story, which helps. So, I, you know, talk to your, 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 your physicians. They're the best advocate for you and the, they understand your individual care. In your story and, and how you can do that, but being also part of, of, of groups, cancer support groups are also helpful as well. So true. So true. Um, and thank you. Thank you for doing what you're doing and being such an advocate. Um, so we just have only one more question, Rich, Bob, or Lisa, um, you know, what other, we are getting a lot and unfortunately we can't get to all of them because we want to be mindful of everyone's time, but we so appreciate everyone sending them in. Um, and there's just so many great questions. So I feel like I have to get on another call with our experts because I need to know the answers as well. Um, for Rich, Bob, or Lisa, what other policy battles are being fought regarding colorectal cancer? Yeah, I'll mention, uh, one uh, that we're dealing with, uh, and we hope to actually see some progress. We've had some uh, Stoney Anderson and others out in California have been real champions uh, to have uh, screening for colorectal cancer be included as a quality measure uh, mm -hmm. in the Medicaid program. It is in the Medicare program, not in the Medicaid program, which is for the, the younger population before the Medicare age. That would be a great uh, success because the Medicaid programs are not including colorectal cancer as a quality measure. The federally qualified health centers have to report it in UDS, but not the Medicaid programs. Uh, it, you know, we already talked about the fact we've just got to get rid of that copay following the non-invasive test. And, you know, that's the ongoing going one that we're still working on. Yeah. Lisa, do you have any comments real quick? Before yeah. Yeah. I agree with yeah, I agree with Rich um, 100%. And the other issue is, you know, how can the um, colon cancer control program at CDC be expanded? You know, we really do need more funding here down here at CDC uh, to make that happen because the program has been quite successful where we've been able to implement. Yeah, that's great. Um, and Bob? Yeah, one last thing I'd, I'd add to all that. Both of those are really high priorities. Right now, we still have a lot of low sensitivity stool tests on the market, both F, uh, guaiac based FOBT and FIT. So some way that we could actually make sure that the only tests that are being used are high sensitivity, high sensitivity stool tests would be a very high priority. And that's something I think we have to work with mm -hmm. the FDA and also educate physicians. You know, it's hard to make physicians the target of this kind of education because they don't pull out a catalog and order their FB, FOBT or FIT tests. You know, somebody in, in you know, the, uh, you know, provisions does that. Secondly, follow-up of a positive stool test is still a big problem, big, yes. big problem. And there's actually, it's a startling amount of flexibility that people seem to be all allowing for how much time should elapse. One of the big reasons that the follow-up is a problem because so many, if you're, if you're poor, if you're on Medicaid or don't have Medicaid, uh, so many, uh, Gastroenterology, gastroenterology facilities do not accept patients without insurance or Medicaid. Yep, or Medicaid. So it just mm -hmm. becomes a rolling problem to get those, those tests scheduled. Finally, we're entering a new era of new kinds of, of screening tests. And ultimately, we're going to have to adapt to how we're going to evaluate and utilize blood-based biomarker tests for screening. Um, probably colorectal cancer has more of these in the pipeline than any uh, other kind of screening test. And it's, it's going to be a new reality, and we have to come to terms with it. 
Thank you for your insight. Um, I always learn so much on our webcast and I'm, I'm already looking forward to next March. Um, Rich, uh, what do our viewers have to look forward to before then? Well, the, thanks everyone. Uh, just a few things. Uh, please join us Thursday, April 15th. We have it up on the screen. Uh, this is our follow-up webinar where we're taking our group who helped us uh, put together our playbook and we're going to look at the landscape a year into the pandemic Thursday, April 15th from two to three. Uh, so please join us That's Eastern time. Uh, we have a new communications education portal to help you in developing effective messaging to reaching people in every community. We're really excited about that. Please stay uh, connected through nccrt.org. We have so many amazing resources. I can't tell you how many people I've said you need some tools, just go to nccrt.org. They're all there. Uh, check out our social media channels. As always, uh, uh, you know, we learn from you uh, and we give you the opportunity to share that. Uh, if you're not sure how, just check out, uh, you know, communicate with Emily Bell. She's always ready to. Uh, and share what you're doing this March, the rest of the year, and we're going to keep things going. Uh, use hashtag 80 in every community. Uh, we'll be watching because uh, that's how we advance this cause and reach our 80% goal. Yeah, great work. Um, Rich and all of our guests, thank you so much for joining us again. We can't wait to see you guys next year. Congrats to all the award winners. And thank you so much to our, our audience for watching and, um, and helping us reach 80% every community. It's just such a wonderful initiative helping so many people. Um, have a great day, everyone. Keep up the wonderful work. Bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you.